Give me a second. Hi, everyone. Welcome to America's Score Soccer Summit. We'll get started in a moment. We'll just let everyone get into the Zoom room. All right. What's the weather like where you're at, Cindy? Um, you know, it's a little chillier than I would have liked it to be right now and a little rainy. So mm. but that's weather in North Carolina. One day it's rainy and cold and the next day it's sunny and warm so i wish you could send some of that rain over here we really need it mm -hmm. in california but not too much of it yeah just enough to saturate the ground and come back definitely is that where you're from cindy north carolina no i grew up in memphis tennessee okay and then i came here to go to school at unc and mm -hmm. then never really left left to play for the national mm -hmm. team and the pro teams mm -hmm. um but ever since then, I've been here. I love North Carolina. I think it's so beautiful. Me too. <laughs> Trying to get Danielle back here. <laughs> <laughs> I almost played tennis at UNC years and years and years ago. Um, but in, but ended up staying ended up being close. somewhere else. No, I ended up going to USC, but I didn't. I didn't play tennis there. And the, it was just kind of one of those weird things where I just ended up for a variety of reasons, injuries and such, I ended up not playing in college, but, um, but that's a fabulous school. That's one sport I wish I played more of as a kid. Yeah, it's, a, it's good. It's, it's different and it's, you know, it's very individual, which um, has its attributes and some negative aspects too. Like I wish that, I was so focused on tennis that I, and I played volleyball too and, and soccer. Um, but I wish that I had focused a little bit more on team sports too. Cause I feel like you get, there's, you learn so much more. Um, I mean, you know, tennis stuff comes in handy too, when it, you have to like perform or you have to do something and it's all on you, like kind of that pressure, you understand all of that. Um, but I think it's important for kids to kind of have a little bit of both, you know? Yeah. I just wish I'd played tennis because I can't play soccer and basketball anymore. It hurts to oh, <laughs> like tennis. <laughs> I could somewhat play if I yeah. was good at it. But every time I go out there, I just try to hit the ball as hard as I can. So it doesn't work out so well. It's, it's therapy. You know, it's I try therapy. to do that too. <laughs> no one wants to play against me because it's no fun because they never get a ball to hit back. My husband says that too. He's like, okay, stop taking your aggression down the ball. I actually want to rally. <laughs> so it looks like we have critical mass and folks are writing in where they're they're zooming in from okay. Salinas, Arlington, Chicago, Bay Area, San Diego. Um, so folks from all over, we go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm going to welcome everybody. Hello, welcome to the SCORE Soccer Summit. My name is Angela Bailey. I work for the Bay Area Affiliate, we, where we serve over 2000, as we call them, poet athletes across the nation. America scores Bay Area is in 12 different cities with 306 schools, 522 teams, over a thousand coaches and over 12,000 poet athletes who have written more than 40,000 poems. So we are so glad to have everybody here today. We are so happy to run these score soccer summits so that our community can come together. That's what it is all about, supporting our youth, supporting women in the game and a special thank you to women in soccer please join their membership. They help to bring everybody, no matter what you do in the soccer community together. So after this session, sign up at Women in Soccer or attend their session in the Soccer Summit. Um, and also I have to give a big shout out to Goal5, who is also one of our lead partners because they are giving out a prize every single session. So cross your fingers. If you're an attendee, you might win a prize from Goal5. Definitely check them out. And there would be no summit, of course, without our incredible speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Alicia Yano, who is also out of the America Scores Bay Area affiliate and put this whole thing together. Props to Alicia. Uh, and I'm gonna lead by giving us some inspiration before we're inspired by our speakers with one of our America Scores Bay Area poems written by Isabel at Moscone Elementary who is in fourth grade, check this out. Mm -hmm. Her title of the poem is Athlete's Paradise. Soft grass and a single ball sway in the wind, 
while parents shout and cheer their, to their daughters and sons. Itchy shin guards and long socks move as if cheering me on. As the cool water responds to my body, the sweat drop kisses my temples and whispers a sweet champion song to my ears. Pen and markers dance with the paper to appreciate our fellow players. Friday's hot sun brings blue skies and loud laughter. Rainbow shirts and alligator shoes fill the fields. Friday soccer is where you'll find an athlete's paradise. Who can't relate to that? <laughs> thank you guys so much. Prepare to be inspired and thanks for joining. We'll see you soon. Hi everyone. Again, thanks to Angela. I would like to introduce award-winning journalist and news anchor from KPIX, Elizabeth Cook, who has kindly um, volunteered after I asked um, to do some interviewing today. So Elizabeth, take it over and we will be inspired as Angela says. Thank you. <laughs> No doubt by our incredible guests. Well, good morning and welcome to the SCORES Soccer Summit, a week-long event aimed at empowering young people through sports and mentorship. This week, we will be speaking to legendary athletes and leaders in the world of soccer. As Alicia mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Cook. I anchor weeknights for KPIX5 in San Francisco. I'm also a former athlete, and I believe in the power of team sports and positive coaching and mentorship can have an amazing impact on a young person. No question, the lessons you take away from those experiences can have an invaluable impact for the rest of your life. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by two icons, Cindy Parlo Cohn and Danielle Slayton. Cindy Parlo Cohn is U.S. soccer's first female president. Pretty amazing. She played for the U.S. women's national team from 1996 to 2004, was a member of the historic 1999 FIFA Women's World Cup championship team. She also won two Olympic gold medals in 1996, 2004, in a career that spanned 158 caps, saw her score 75 international goals, hope I got that right, which is the eighth all-time leader in U.S. history. Whoa. During the past 20 years, she has served on U.S. Soccer's Referee Committee, Medical Advisory Committee, Appeals Committee, and the Athletes Council, as well as more recently with U.S. Soccer's Youth Task Force. She was inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame in 2018, Carlo Cohn was a four-time All-American at the University of North Carolina and was on teams that won three NC2A titles. She was also the first head coach to win a national championship, <laughs> Women's Soccer League Championship, guiding Portland Thorns FC to the title in 2013 during the league's inaugural season. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much for joining us. We're also Thanks joined. For Thank you. And, I and won two national championships at UNC, though. Oh, okay. Well. Details. I wish I'd won that third and fourth, but it was only two. Well, Danielle Slayton also joins us. She is the Director of External Relations within the School of Education and Counseling Psychology at Santa Clara University. She also is an alum from SCU. Danielle has led the women's soccer team to the 20, 2001 NC2A National Championship. Before taking on her current role, she was the director of SCU's Coaching for Life Academy, where she developed and helped provide professional development opportunities for youth sports coaches. Danielle was a member of the U.S. Women's National Team from 2000 to 2005, winning a silver medal at the 2000 Olympics and a bronze in the two, uh, 2003 FIFA World, Women's World Cup. After she retired from playing, Danielle coached soccer at Northwestern University from 2006 to 2009, where she also earned her master's degree in sports administration. In addition to her position at Santa Clara, Danielle is a soccer television analyst with the San Jose Earthquakes and on NBC, Fox Sports, and the Pac-12 Networks. She also serves on the board of directors for both U.S. Soccer Foundation and the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative. Danielle and Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. A lot of accomplishments there. I'm gonna start with a really simple question and all these questions are directed at both of you. So feel free to, to chime in whenever you think of something and you know, I, they're, they're both, it's, this is supposed to be more of a conversation. So we're just gonna start with a really simple question. How did both of you get started in soccer? You first, Cindy? <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> um, well, I have two older brothers and one younger brother. Um, and I was just the annoying younger sister to my two older brothers. And I wanted to do everything they were doing. Um, and luckily, one of the things they were involved in was sports and specifically soccer. So I literally joined one of my older brother's soccer teams when I was like three. My dad was the coach. And so that was my first introduction to sports. Um, and I just loved it. I love being active. I love being outside. Uh, and I just took to the game right away. I had a little bit of a similar story um, that I was a, a pretty active kid. And I think um, I was breaking, I think I broke a lamp or something running around my, <laughs> my parents' house. And my parents said, oh gosh, we got to get this girl into something. And soccer happened to be the next sport that was like starting on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, registered me in the local AYSO, the local recreational league in my neighborhood. And I started playing. I played with an all boys team at the time. They did not have all girls teams for four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. so I was the only girl on a, on a, a team of full of boys. Um, and eventually, you know, once I was a little older, I got to join an all girls team, but started out just in my neighborhood running around and getting that energy out. That's great. It's such a, it's a very common story of how you get involved in a sport, but what kind of kept you both in it? What, what was something about soccer that made you really want to stick with it? I, yeah, I, I go, Cindy. No, I was asking if you wanted to go first on this one. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I would say, you know, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. Uh, I came from a big sports family. Both of my parents are PE teachers. So we were always doing something. And I ran track and played volleyball and played softball and played soccer. Um, but for me, the two sports that really stuck were track and soccer. And I think I ultimately decided to, to stick with soccer because I really liked the team aspect of it. Yes, I liked track and, you know, I like, we were talking a little bit before um, all of the, the participants joined on the webinar about your experience playing tennis, Elizabeth. And I liked the, the pressure of, you know, knowing that you could do it on your own and you're out on the track and it's just you and mm -hmm. trying to get to that finish line first. But more than that, I love the aspect of being part of a team. And mm -hmm. that's really why soccer resonated with me and ultimately mm -hmm. why I decided to stick with soccer as I was making that decision in my teen years, if you will. Mm -hmm. What about you, Cindy? What kept you with yeah, soccer? Yeah, I kind of have, yeah, I kind of have a similar story. I played lots of sports growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, um, where I differ from Danielle is that I was a really quiet, reserved kid. Mm -hmm. And so playing sports and specifically on the soccer field and the basketball court were my refuge. Mm -hmm. It was where I felt most at home. It's where I felt like I could be myself and I could express myself. I didn't have to apologize um, for being good or wanting to be good. Um, and so, and I spent a lot of time actually playing with and against my brothers at a young age. And then as I grew older, um, I joined a girls team, but I continued to train with boys and it was just, I just felt at home there. It's like where I was the most relaxed. And so that's, and the, and the game just made sense to me. And as I mentioned before, I just love being outside. I love the team aspect of it, as Danielle mentioned. Um, and I just felt myself growing as a person, not only as a player through the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you talk to a lot of young athletes and one of the reasons why some of them may switch sports or maybe get out of them at times is because they encounter challenges and they're, and it's hard for them to push through. Can you talk a little bit about any challenges that you encountered when you were a young athlete just starting out and how did you push through those challenges? Danielle, do you want to go or you want me to? No, you go ahead. We'll take turns. We'll just alternate. <laughs> okay. I can direct it too, but that's easier. I can hey, you know, Danielle, we can start with you. That makes it a little bit easier. Then you're not worried about talking over each other. No, that's all right. Um, I think one of my main challenges, as I said before, is that I was so quiet and reserved. Mm -hmm. um, and when I played with boys, I didn't have to apologize for trying hard or wanting to be the best. But I found it challenging at times on girls teams where that wasn't as well accepted. Um, I would like my teammates and my teammates parents would ask me and my parents like, why does Cindy try so hard? Why does she care so much? Mm -hmm. um, and 
it was really hard for me to kind of find that balance between what friend, what my friends wanted me to do and what I knew in my heart that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because I knew that I was this fierce competitor and that I wanted to be as good as I could. And then I wanted to push myself and try hard. Um, but society was kind of telling me to be the sweet little girl mm-hmm. um, and pleasing and well, I had no problem being kind and nice to people off the field. I don't think anyone ever used the word sweet to describe me. Um, <laughs> but on the field, I, was, I had zero interest in being kind and sweet. I wanted to compete. I wanted to win. I wanted to push myself. And I think just socially as a kid, um, mm-hmm. I, I found navigating those differences really challenging. And what about you, Danielle? I would say, I mean, I think, you know, being a a teenager is hard. Um, Being a kid is hard. I think it's even harder now than, you know, than when we were young. And so navigating a lot of the the emotions of, you know, Mm -hmm. figuring out who you are and and what that means um, is a challenge. I feel like I was lucky in that um, I played for a very competitive um, youth sports team, youth soccer team. And, um, I had a lot of people who were like me, right? Mm-hmm. Unlike maybe Cindy, who was trying to navigate that. I did play on a team where it was okay to compete. It was okay to go hard. It was okay mm-hmm. to, to battle and then walk off the field and be like, okay, let's go get lunch or let's, you know, go to the movie. Like that, that was okay. I think some of the things that I um, struggled with was that I didn't have that like in my neighborhood. So I had to travel mm-hmm. across town to do that. Mm-hmm. I always felt like um, I was the one having to leave my neighborhood, leave my little bubble and go across town to the west side. I grew up on East San Jose and I had to go to West San Jose to be able to, to find you know, my team. So I felt like um, just navigating, getting outside of you know, the place that I grew up in the little small area I grew up um, mm-hmm. forced me to, to kind of see the world differently and, and grow mm-hmm. up a little bit faster in that regard. Mm-hmm. I would say also too, um, you know, not maybe quite as much when I was young, but just always managing like an injury or if you're getting, you know, managing your body is something that's mm-hmm. hard. If you maybe twist an ankle or have a knee injury or something like that, big or small, learning how to take care of your body and listen to your body um, while also working hard and, and fighting to come back from something like that was definitely a challenge that I think almost anybody is going to face if they play sports long enough. Mm-hmm. For either of you, and I uh, and I want to I want to mention to our viewers that if you'd like to ask a question, you can just put it in the chat. We're going to continue the conversation, but every once in a while, I'll go and look at the chat and see if we have any questions from the audience, and we can direct those to um, both Cindy and Danielle. But just to follow up on that, you know, when you're going through this kind of journey of not only being a teenage girl, but also developing your game and getting stronger as an athlete, and as you start to make those next huge strides, both of you played on the national level with amazing success. Was there a, would you say there was a moment where you had kind of an aha moment where you felt like, okay, this is who, this is, this is how I'm going to overcome this challenge. Or was it just something you felt like that kind of that development sort of came with, with time, with maturity and just sort of more experiences. Was there an aha moment for either of you? Cindy, I'll start with you. (laughs) It was Danielle's turn. (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) Danielle, why don't you start? Why don't you? Talk? I'll, I'll try to flip back and forth if I can remember. Who's to which one. Um, you know, I don't know that for me, I can say mm-hmm. there was an aha moment. But when I mm-hmm. look back at um, my career and I look back at, you know, the things I learned from a young age all the way up through being an adult, I think one thing that I learned is that consistent work and consistent application Mm -hmm. um, is what enabled me to be successful. Like I treated practice and games the same. Like it was, okay, let's go to work. And whether it was training or whether it was, you know, a small game in my local town or Mm -hmm. on the biggest of world stage, it was, it was the same game. It was still a ball, 22 Mm -hmm. people in between some white lines. And so I approached it um, I tried to approach it as matter of fact uh, and mm-hmm. as business-like, if you will, um, mm-hmm. as I could. And so I think for me, that consistent application of just going to work, going to work, one day you yeah. look up and you're like, oh, wow, like I used to be way back there and now I'm here. And so I have mm-hmm. made progress. You don't necessarily notice it every day or every training, but right. if you stop it and look up a little bit. I think um, you, you can 
you you notice those things. And I think mm-hmm. that would be one of my um my I guess what I'd say my biggest regret was that I wish I had stopped more frequently to look up and celebrate and appreciate what I had accomplished and what um how far I had come in the journey when I was in it. I think I can do that now, mm-hmm. but I wish I had done that in real time a little bit better. Yeah. What about you, Cindy? Oh man, I hundred percent agree with Danielle. But Danielle, I think that's also what made you so great is that you didn't look back and say, hey, look how great I am. Like you kept pushing and working, um, which I mean, anyone that has been around Danielle, you know, whatever she's doing, she throws 100% mm-hmm. into it and is never going to be outworked. Um, for me, my, I don't know that it was a moment um, because I'm a little slow in the uptake sometimes. Um, so it probably lasted more than just a moment, but I think for me, I spent so much of my youth pushing myself to be the best. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to be the best soccer player, the best basketball player, the best student. Um, and so I was always just, I was very, um, just looking at what I was doing, Mm -hmm. um, and what I needed to do to be better. And that lasted pretty much until I got onto the national team. And that was what, when I- We're 16, 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I got on the national team at 14, 12, I forget. <laughs> okay, it's my turn. We're supposed to be quiet right now. <laughs> um, but like I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. Uh, <laughs> I was so focused on what I needed to do to be the best mm-hmm. that I didn't take, I didn't look up and see all of my teammates for who they were and what they needed from me so that I could help make them their, the best version of themselves mm-hmm. um, until I got to the national team. And I was around amazing leaders that showed me what true leadership is and what it is to be a good teammate. Um, so, I mean, the likes of Carla Overbeck, Julie Foudy, um, I mean, just unbelievable people that literally took me under their wing at 16, 17 years old and showed me how to be a positive leader, how to have a positive impact on other people's experiences. And so I think for me, that was kind of the aha moment, so to speak, um, that these veterans who I literally had a poster up on my wall, still at home of them, Mm -hmm. um, when I'm playing with them and they were communicating with me and trying to help me as much as they could within the national team. And it was just kind of like, wow, I can't believe they took time to talk to little old me. Um, (laughs) so that just kind of stuck with me. And I, I, I tried to, to pay it forward through my years on the national team. Wow. That's incredible. You know, both of you are incredible female athletes and also, you know, in a, in a, the whole soccer field, you know, the, the, what am I trying to say here? The world of soccer is still very much male dominated. Can you talk a little bit about the differences for women in the sport of soccer and how maybe you overcame some of those obstacles when it came to men and women playing soccer? Cindy, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, for me growing up playing, you know, as I mentioned before, Mm -hmm. I played on boys teams. And even when I was on the national team, when I came home, uh, I would go train with a boys team. And even in uh, high school, I was, I played on a, a, in the men's league. Mm -hmm. So I've always played with um, and against boys. So I don't know that I was really aware as a kid that this was unusual Um, because it was there wasn't much available at that time when I was growing up and so I played on my my girls team and we were pretty competitive we did some Mm -hmm. good things Um, but because I always had that other outlet of playing with and against boys and men I didn't really see that much difference and and the way my parents raised me there was no difference between Mm -hmm. my brothers and me and so whatever my brothers were doing um, I was allowed to do. I actually have a funny story on myself that I don't remember how old I was. My parents love to tell the story though. Um, but I was doing this class that was gymnastics for a part of it. And then it switched to ballet and I loved the gymnastics part. Um, I loved all the tumbling and, and all of that. And then it switched to ballet. And all of a sudden I had to wear a leotard and a tutu. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I wasn't as excited about that, but I was fine with wearing it as long as I could wear my soccer cleats (laughs) (laughs) at ballet. So I I come downstairs, my mom tells me it's time to go to ballet and I have on my leotard, my tutu and my cleats on. And she's like, honey, you can't wear your cleats to ballet. And I was like, (laughs) I can't wear my cleats, then I'm not going. My brothers don't have, they can wear their cleats to all their sports. And if I can't wear mine, then I don't want to do that sport. (laughs) And so my parents were like, I guess we're not going to ballet anymore. So, (laughs) So, I mean, so like there was never, there was like, I never really knew any different. Um, and so I think it wasn't until later in life that I, I was kind of opened up my eyes and saw the greater view and, and, and the issues around girls sports. Mm-hmm. What about you, Danielle? Um, you know, I, I would say being a woman in a, a male dominated industry is not any different than probably it is, you know, in television or in, you know, medicine or, or business and tech. I mean, I, in the Bay Area, right? Like mm-hmm. we, we see that, but it's interesting. One of the stories that always sticks in my mind that I think might be applicable to this group and um, a colleague and a friend of ours, Mia Ham, she has um, three kids, um, two daughters. And she, I remember her when she was just starting to coach her daughters. Um, and we were talking about um, how you know, when, when little girls play soccer, uh, we always say, oh, you got to pass the ball and you have to be nice and we all have to share. And I remember Mia being like, I don't want a kid who's going to just default and pass the ball. Like, I want the kid who was willing to take on and to dribble and say, I'm going to dribble seven people and I'm going to do it again and I'm going to do it again. And that concept mm-hmm. of, you know, taking ownership and taking responsibility and willing to compete and willing to go after it. And that always stuck with me. Um, this idea that, you know, there's this, this part of society, I guess, that maybe tells you as a young girl or as a woman that to Cindy's point, like you have to be nice and you have to be sweet. And yes, we all have to be polite and civil, but it's okay to compete. It's okay Mm -hmm. to want to be the best. It's okay to say, I mm-hmm. want to be the president of US soccer one day, right? Like those things are okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we can appreciate um, if a girl, if a woman wants to, to be that way, just the way that we should appreciate if a little boy wants to wear a tutu and, and do ballet, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, I think a lot about that when I think about, you know, what we tell our kids and what we tell young girls playing soccer um, and how we communicate these things either consciously or unconsciously about what it's okay for little girls to do and be and say and act in the same way that we think of little boys. Yeah, just one quick follow-up question before we get to our some of our, the questions from our chat. Do you still feel like there's a double standard? Did you ever feel like there was a double standard for women in, in, in soccer? I, I think so. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think it's hopefully changing, um, you know, but I, I don't think progress happens in a straight line. Um, right. I remember, you know, when we were playing, I mean, the amount of hours I spent after games signing autographs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved it. I loved interacting with the fans, mm-hmm. but like, I, I felt an obligation, especially at that time of we have to grow women's sports. We have to grow the game. We have to make sure that little girls are seeing us as role models. And mm-hmm. we would play for 90 minutes and then we would be out there for an hour, 90 mm-hmm. minutes sometimes. Wow finding every single jersey or you know shoe or whatever and I don't felt like I didn't feel like it was that way on the men's side I felt mm-hmm. like you know maybe they would sign a couple things and then and then go about their business but um I hope in a small way that and something like that made an impact um and that someday that you know it it, it won't be the same and maybe it's not as much anymore I don't know yeah what about you Cindy Yeah, I mean, I think similar to what Danielle, you know, I would love to see a sports world that invests in girls and women's sports Mm -hmm. as much as they do in boys and men's sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about soccer specifically, I mean, soccer is the most popular sport in the world and the men's game will continue to grow. There's no doubt about that. But where I feel that soccer has the potential to grow exponentially is on the women's side. Mm -hmm. You know, we need the media, the sponsors, the fans, sports organizations, everyone that's engaged in the sport to see the value and invest in the girls and women's sports. Yeah, I mean, I can't leave this conversation though without talking about pay equality and its importance. 
and the recent decision for equal working conditions at the U.S. women's national team. Why is this so important, not just for soccer, for, but for women in general, not only in athletics, but in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, as everyone knows, we have the best women's team in the world. Um, yeah. We've got two people on this phone call that were a part of it before. Um, we've been a leader in the world in driving women's soccer forward. Um, and obviously, as a former women's national team mm -hmm. player, I assure you, I am committed to equal pay. Um, and it was a great step forward with the women's national team and settling part of the little gate litigation. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that we can continue the collaboration and find resolution um, to the outstanding litigation that's still out there. Um, because I know that if we unite forces with the women, it, it can go so far to amplify our efforts to make a larger impact across the world, you know, where women's soccer around the world still isn't being invested in as much as it should or, or could be. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said before, I think there's exponential potential for growth mm -hmm. in, the, in the women's game. Danielle, do you have anything to add about that? I, I agree with that. I mean, and I just, yeah. you know, I think that uh, organizations, I mean, from the top on down, right? Like whether it's, you know, different leagues around the world, whether it's FIFA themselves mm -hmm. are realizing like, holy, mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know, a whole other product, i.e. women's soccer that we just have to replicate. Like we just have mm -hmm. to invest a little bit in and we don't have to do anything different. We already have a men's world cup and a women's world cup. We mm -hmm. just need to funnel some of our energy and, and, and time and investment and resources, and we're going to get this huge payout at the end. Mm -hmm. Like you can make the business case for it. You can make the moral case for it. You can mm -hmm. make the ethical case for it. And so to me, it's, it's a no brainer. And I think mm -hmm. the United States is perfectly poised and positioned to help lead this charge. Yeah, no question. I mean, as somebody who's not necessarily in the soccer world, just to, uh, for female professionals watching that fight, it was so inspiring. And I think you're going to see the impact of that across all industries. And I think that we have women's soccer to thank for a lot of that because it needed that kind of voice. It needed that kind of power. And uh, I'm anxious to see, you know, what the impact was, which we know there will be. So, all right. I want to, I want to get to the chat. Some of these questions here, some of them are directed um, uh, to you guys uh, individually. And some of it's kind of for everybody. Uh, this is for Cindy as the U S soccer Federation president. What is the hardest thing to change slash improve in that role that as a player you thought would be easy to change? And this comes easy to change. This is coming from Shannon Noble. Yeah, well, I've been involved with the Federation at many levels um, for a couple of decades. So I know that change is not easy, um, but it's much like anything that you do within a team. You know, um, if you want to move in a certain direction, you need to make sure that you have a team on board with you that wants to move and row the boat, so to speak, in the same direction as you. So I think that was first and foremost. Um, where I, I started, I mean, obviously I came in as president at a crazy interesting time, you know, yeah. um, we had just had the offense, very offensive um, legal filing um, that led to the resignation of the former president. And then COVID-19 hit and our world was shutting down. It was, I literally became president the day um, that the sports world was shutting down here in the U.S. So it was an interesting time um, and then followed up uh, by the, the social injustice and the police brutality um, and with all of that. And so I just had to take a step back, um, call my friends <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and figure out, okay, where do we need to go? What do we need to do? Um, and so for me, I think having that core group of friends that I can bounce ideas off, um, the, the people who can advise you and are in your corner, um, but also can challenge you, I think is really important. And so for me, um, first and foremost, what's and what I'm is one of my number one priorities um, along with solving the litigation with the women's national team um, is improving di diversity, equity, inclusion at U.S. Mm -hmm. soccer. Um, 
this is key to everything that we do and it's going to inform every decision that we make. Um, and I'm proud to say that everyone's on board and we are working hard on it. And so um, I think that's one of the first priorities, but I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Um, DEI is not easy <laughs> in any organization to change it. And so, but I'm not interested in just hitting low hanging fruit and say, hey, look what I do, what I did, you know. Um, I wanna find things where, that can be impactful long after I leave the president seat um, mm -hmm. to benefit the Federation and soccer in this country. Mm -hmm. I just wanna uh, follow up with the talking about diversity, equity, inclusion with a question for you, Danielle, as an athlete of color, of, as a woman of color in soccer, what do you think needs to be done to reach out to more communities to get them interested in the game? And, and do you think people are doing enough? Do you think that organizations are doing enough? I mean, that's a monster question, right? I like, know, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a huge question, a loaded question. Forever, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, if anything good can happen from much of the civil unrest of the summer, I think mm -hmm. that a lot of eyes have been open to, to understanding that there are differences. There are real differences in this country. Um, and people can walk around in America and experience it in a very, very different way. Um, I am hopeful that that um, awareness continues to lead to action mm -hmm. um, and to reaching out to um, groups of color or to, to, to areas where there's underserved um, a population and finding ways to bring them into the game, finding ways to reach out. I mean, I think it's such a deep issue. Like we could talk about sports, we could talk about education, we could talk mm -hmm. about police. I mean, there's so many aspects of it, mm -hmm. but um, I am hopeful that we are starting to do more. I think we have a terribly long way to go still. Um, but I do feel like, you know, I grew up, I, so I, I ran track and I played soccer. Mm -hmm. Talk about like two like predominantly different demographics when it came to my sports experience growing up. I ran track and I was mostly around other black people. I played soccer and I was mostly around other white kids. Um, mm -hmm. So I felt like I had a little bit of both experiences in that mm -hmm. way. Um, mm -hmm. I still think that we have a long way to go in bringing um, kids of color into the game. I think a lot mm -hmm. of it too has to do with our pay to play to model. I think a lot of it has to do mm -hmm. with um, equity in terms of you know getting access. But mm -hmm. um, I think bringing up the conversation, I appreciate the question because I think it needs to be part of the conversation and how we're gonna start to to mm -hmm. find a solution because it's not an easy solution. If it's right. it an easy solution, it'd have been done by now. And it's new right. and it's complicated and it's messy. Um, but I think it's gonna take all of us to Cindy's point rowing in the same direction mm -hmm. for a long sustained effort to start to make an impact in this area. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you talked a little bit about, you know, just what a crazy year this has been. You're the first female president of US soccer. And you know you encountered all these big challenges, and then oh by the way, let's add COVID nineteen to all of that. Um, this is kind of a two sided question, and I'm and I'm it's it's directed at both of you. But um, Cindy, talk a little bit about being the first female president and the impact that's going to have. And then I'll have the second question that maybe we can start with Danielle on. But but tell me a little bit about your position and um, how meaningful it is for the game of soccer. Yeah, well, I may be the first female president, um, but I'm also the first former national team player to serve as president. So, um, and I may be the first, but I'm, I'm hoping, and I mean, I know that I won't be the last uh, mm -hmm. to serve in this role, but I, I think it's important for a lot of reasons. It's important to have an athlete lead the organization because I mean, that's, a, that's eventually who we're affecting. That's what we're doing mm -hmm. all this for is, are the athletes, um, mm -hmm. from the youth athletes to the national team players, to the professionals, to the adult um, weekend warriors. You know, it, it is all about the athlete. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the first female, I feel like this is the time, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere I look and turn, females are breaking down the glass ceiling. So um, let's continue on this path. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, this isn't to anything against men because I have great men that I work with as well that helped me along the way and, and, and put me in the place that I'm, I am today. So I think mm -hmm. it's also important to think about the people that helped you get to where you are, mm -hmm. um, um, regardless of demographic. Mm -hmm. It's all about lifting each other up. 
regardless of all of that, no question. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this year and how crazy it's been. And we talked a little bit about before this conversation began, so much of it is out of our control. And maybe Danielle, I'll start with you. You know, your school has definitely, Santa Clara has had to pivot, not only scholastically with COVID-19, but also the student athletes. And I just, I can't help but think about, you know, how challenging of a game soccer is and all of the things you have to go through, not only on the field, but just as your journey as an athlete. Do you think that, that you know, your career as a soccer player and, and working through all those challenges has helped you um, with this current challenge of COVID-19 and just sort of adapting to all of that and, and, and being able to, to handle the challenges that, that have come up from that? Most certainly, uh, no question in my mind. Um, it's funny, I think um, when you use the word control, um, I and Cindy will laugh about this because you know we worked with a sports psychologist and mm -hmm. on the national team. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we talked, we spent a lot of time talking about controlling what you can control and then mm -hmm. you know putting the rest off to the side, right? Like mm -hmm. I can't control my parent if my parents get tickets to the game. I can't control if we're playing against seven foot Norwegian Vikings, like or <laughs> three is terrible, or you know, whatever. I can't control these things. Um, mm -hmm. But what I can control is my attitude, my work rate, how I treat other people, what I give, you know, um, the perspective I take, things like that. And I think about that all of the time, and especially right now. Um, I jokingly call, um, you know, some of the, the psychological skills that we learned, I, I call it athleticism as a transferable skill. Like what I learned as an athlete, how I transfer it to my world now that I no longer play soccer. And mm -hmm. um, I think about controlling what I can control um, a lot because you know what, I can't really control a lot right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's frustrating and it's hard and I know it's hard on everybody. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I'm grateful for that skill and I'm grateful for being able to focus on what I can make a, a little bit better in my neighborhood, in my small little world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I choose to spend my time and energy on because quite frankly, if I didn't, I'm, I might, go crazy. Like I might, you know, I would just be a miserable person and that's not who I want to be. And that's not, you know, right. what, the way I want to spend 2020 if I can, mm -hmm. what can mm -hmm. I control? I can control, you know, these, these four or five things and I'm going to do the best I can at that. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, to all the coaches who are out there, like I, I do have to say that the amount of time I spent practicing the game, like the physical, technical, as mm -hmm. tactical aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. We spent a ton of time on the national team focusing on the psychological side and mm -hmm. we practiced it on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a really important piece of the game. And it's a really mm -hmm. important piece of the game that can help you as an athlete, but mm -hmm. to me, helps me tremendously now that I no longer can play. Yeah, no question. Cindy, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Danielle says, as I usually do. Um, but this game has given me so much, both on and off the field. Like, mm -hmm. I am literally the person I am today and the leader that I am because of soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, any you think, and now as a parent, I think about, like, all the things that I want to teach my son. And I think about, okay, how did I learn those? And they were all through sport and specifically soccer. Mm -hmm. um, confidence, resilience, persistence, how to lose, how to win, how to listen and learn, mm -hmm. um, compassion, empathy, kindness, how to be a good teammate. Although I learned that one a little late, um, self-awareness, awareness of others. Like there's just so many lessons that I learned through playing the game mm -hmm. that I would never have been, well, I'm not going to say never, cause you never know what's going to happen, but I don't think that I would be in the position or have said, yes, I'll be president of U.S. soccer, you know, if it hadn't mm -hmm. been for the sport. It gave me the skill set that I needed in order to even say yes, not even do it, but even say yes, to get to that point, to say, yes, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. um, but then also the skills to actually be able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm so thankful to the sport and everything that it has given me. Yeah, no question. I think for me as a, as a spectator watching soccer, I think what, what strikes me is just how incredibly physically demanding it is. But I can imagine so much a part of that is the mental stamina too, of being able to push yourself just that many more minutes or that much harder or run that much faster. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, that kind of resilience and that kind of stamina, you know, 
plays into a huge amount of what, you know, sort of life challenges that you have to sort of overcome, not only when you have these extraordinary challenges like a COVID-19, but just your day-to-day -day of, of getting through, you know, the littler challenges as well. Um, I, I want, I oh, yes. Sorry about that. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, well, it's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time, but um, so I was playing with Cindy. Cindy was actually my roommate. We lived together in 2004. Um, <laughs> For... Should I be a little nervous about this? No, no, no. This is about me. Don't worry. <laughs> You're sick. Good. Um, but um, so we, we lived together in preparation for the 2004 Olympics, and I got cut from that roster. I did not make that roster. Cindy didn't make that roster, um, but I didn't. And fast forward like six, seven years later, and I had retired. I was injured and no longer playing. And I was working at a business in downtown Chicago, and um, layoffs were going on mm -hmm. um in, in my company and you know it's really weird if you've ever been part of company with layoffs like it's just a weird mm -hmm. vibe when you walk in the door and yes. you're like really talking or making eye contact mm -hmm. it's not a good feeling um and I remember this woman was sitting next to me and she was like losing it like she was like hysterical about it and she, she didn't know if she was going to get fired or not but she was just mm -hmm. you know so nervous and worked herself up and I literally remember sitting at my desk and being like I've been cut from the Olympic team. Like I can handle this. This is okay. Like this is no big deal. Like I, I can deal with this. Um, yeah. You know, if they come knocking on my office door. And so, you know, I, I think about that a lot. Is like, you know, things that you don't even know or that might feel terrible at the time. It felt terrible to get cut from the team, mm -hmm. but it also too prepared me for something later in life that was, you know, a, another challenge that I was able to to more easily overcome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought you guys brought up something really interesting when we started talking about, you know, dealing with challenges, because you talked about, you know, it's important that you know how to win, but it's also important that you know how to lose. Can both of you talk, and, I'll, and maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Cindy, because somebody brought up, you know, injuries and how you've overcome injuries through your career or learning how to deal with certain setbacks. Um, why don't I start with you? Um, uh, when, um, one of our viewers wanted to know about your concussion. How did you overcome that? And can it relate to, you know, certain setbacks that you might have gone through as an adult now? Yeah, well, I'll start off. Um, while I learned how to lose, I didn't, I never have learned how to enjoy losing. So <laughs> for a distinction there, <laughs> mm -hmm. I still don't enjoy, I, I'm terrible. I don't like to lose at Uno or anything. Um, <laughs> I don't even let my three-year-old beat me at games. Um, that's <laughs> <how I lose. laughs> um, but one day I do know that he will probably start beating me at, at, as I continue to get older. Um, but for <laughs> injuries, I, th I think that injuries, you know, you play the game long enough. Um, and I think there's not a single person on the national team that you can have a conversation with that couldn't tell you a story about mm -hmm. their injuries and what it did to them on and off the field and how they, the struggle it is to get back in. I mm -hmm. think, um, so my main injury was concussions. And I think um, the hard thing for me with the concussions is it wasn't like a broken leg or I can say, hey, look, my leg, mm -hmm. look at my leg, it's in a cast, I can't play. Mm -hmm. um, and there was so much less known about concussions at this time, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about 20 years ago. So it wasn't front and center like it is now. And so, um, and the doctors didn't know as much, you know, my own doctors were telling me I was fine, um, that I need to get back out there. And I had always been this fierce competitor and not, mm -hmm. and like Danielle, like I love training as much as I do the games like mm -hmm. that. I love training. I love one V one battles and training, um, losing a four V four tournament would like devastate me the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so to have my doctors tell me that I was fine and like, but I knew that I wasn't. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. for some reason I couldn't get fit. And I was like, so I was going out, I was like sneaking out. I was in national team camp and I would sneak out and run extra to try to get fitter, you know? Cause I mean, as a national team player there are standards that are set and it's an awful, awful feeling when you don't meet that standard with your teammates, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I was pushing myself and I, I just was getting in this cycle of, you know, I, I didn't feel fit. I was running more, but it was all due to my concussions um, and the fatigue I was feeling from my concussions. 
Um, I know that now, but I didn't know it at the time. So I was getting in this horrible cycle and it was just, and it was hard. And it was actually the year that Danielle and I were living together um, for, and training for the Olympics. And, you know, there were times where I was like, Danielle, I think you might have to pull me out of this apartment by my ponytail to get me training, <laughs> you know? And luckily she's a good friend. So um, she did what she needed to do to help me out. Um, but we, we just didn't know. And I think that was challenging for me to know something wasn't right but to not know how, I didn't even know how to really advocate for myself because I went to the doctors and they said, oh, you're fine. And they would give me medications and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was the hard thing for me. Um, and as Daniel said, I was, I, I was able to make the 2004 Olympic team. Uh, but then shortly after the Olympics, I decided to retire um, because I, the headaches just weren't getting any better and the fatigue wasn't getting better. Um, but now much later, it's, it's much better. Good. What about you, Danielle? Can you talk about any kind of injuries or, or, or setback? You, you mentioned not making the Olympic team, but maybe on a smaller level, just, you know, losses or, or, or setbacks that you've had to overcome. Yeah, I would say, um, it's funny that whenever people ask me, um, what I'm most proud of when I think about my career, um, I actually say the thing I'm most proud of is learning how to not be a soccer player anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, um, a little bit like like Cindy, I had a, um, an injury, but mine was it, like I had I had no more cartilage in my knee, right? And and the doctors were like, "Well, your your ligaments are fine. It's stable. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. So if you can gut it out, go ahead." Um, obviously, not as you know dangerous, I would say, as a concussion in that regard. Um, but it was a matter of like as long as you can grind it out, then you have the go ahead, you know, from the doctors. Um, but I couldn't, um, eventually it just was too much. And so my career kind of just quietly faded to black and I was done and I just didn't get called in anymore. Um, and so I would say that, you know, the challenge for me was, um, I had always learned all of these great skills in soccer, right? Like work harder, suffer, sacrifice, get up early, train more. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't learn early on or early mm -hmm. enough was that you can't really do that with your feelings. And so when you're mm -hmm. grieving the loss that you don't get to play soccer anymore, or you're grieving the loss of this, what did I try to do? Suck it up. Don't mm -hmm. tell anybody, work harder, put my head down. And what I really needed to do was ask for help and say, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of depressed and I'm sad that I don't get to play soccer anymore. And it wasn't my mm -hmm. choice and mm -hmm. I feel terrible and I don't know what I'm supposed to do next and all of these things. Um, and so for me, I would say that that was a really, really hard period of my life. I didn't ask for help um, as soon as I think I should have or could have. Um, but eventually I found my way back and out of it. Eventually I found my way back to the game that I love. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that that was a, a really tough thing for me in terms of um, kind of learning those soft skills that I hadn't learned because I so early on put my head down and competed and worked. And I had to realize that that doesn't really work with your feelings. It makes me a much better friend and a much yeah. better wife now and a much better like probably a sibling and daughter. Um, mm -hmm. But that was a really tough time for me, um, but something I'm proud that I've kind of uh, figured out how to do. Yeah, that's beautifully articulated just because I think so many people go through that and have to deal with stuff that's just out of your control and you don't want it to happen. You try so hard to make it not be the case, but then you have to kind of, the challenge I guess is, is just moving through that blockade and, and figuring out a new normal and, and, and finding a new way of life. And that's a success in itself. I wanna make sure we get this question in. It's from Cindy. Uh, what is the best way for independent grassroots soccer groups like America Scores to partner with the Federation? Um, as far as just kind of getting other groups. We talked a little bit about outreach um, early on in this conversation. What's the best way for somebody that wants to get more people involved in soccer to start um, to get involved? Yeah, I mean, first step is to reach out to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that's the easy, easiest <laughs> thing to do. Um, and then can I add on something to Danielle? Cause we have a funny story about an injury. Um, so Danielle, oh. we're <laughs> we can get back to Daniel's answer for that one. Yeah, you guys go yeah. ahead and we'll get back. I'll ask the question again afterwards. Yeah, um, but Danielle and I were playing against each other um, in the pro league and I'm going against her and we're both fighting for the ball. 
And all of a sudden, like I put my arm out and Danielle's a little shorter than me. Um, so while I thought I was putting my arm out like on her chest to, to shield the ball, my elbow catches her nose and I feel her nose crunch underneath my elbow. <laughs> and this is a really intense part of the game. And we both just kind of stop. And my coach is yelling at me to go, go. And I'm like, I just broke her nose. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in the middle of a professional game and we both just stop and I'm like looking at her and I'm like are you okay <laughs> yep true story true story um <laughs> but luckily I went to the doctor everything was fine I got a little crack here but it's all healed since but <laughs> Cindy has done a lot of amazing things you read all of her amazing bios but the thing that should go like last on the list of the mm -hmm. perfect collection is broke Danielle's nose in a soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> And she and never so forgot it. No, no, no. <laughs> sorry. At least I never apologized. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, let's, I'm going to ask that, that past question more time. Um, what this is this from um, Cindy? What is the best way for independent grassroots soccer groups like America Scores partner with the Federation? What's the best way for them to do that? Well, I mean, just what I said, reach out and start the conversation. Um, right. We do work with a lot of different organizations. Um, Danielle and I are both on the board of the U.S. Soccer Foundation. Uh, we do a lot of work um, together to help provide soccer and programming in underserved mm -hmm. communities, um, as well as we work with other organizations. So I, I just think the first step is reaching out and starting the conversation. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Danielle? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, this game is vast and broad. And I think, um, you know, that's part of the challenge that the Federation has, right? You're, you're dealing with youth soccer in 50 different states and how many different cities and all the different, you know, aspects that go into to that particular area. You're dealing with the professional game. You're dealing with the elite national teams. You're dealing with adult league soccer. So the challenge that the Federation has is that they're trying to hold this space for all of these individual groups. And so what's important for a group like America Scores might be different than what's important for another group. So as Cindy mentioned, like the most important thing or the, the great first step is reaching out and saying, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is the population we serve. This is what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, there are partnerships. There are collaborations all over the place, but it's a matter of being what's um, or focusing on what's specific and important for your position, your particular um, organization and your athletes that mm -hmm. is important for the federation to be able to to help partner in, in the right way not just kind of a namesake only all right so we're we're getting up on on one hour here so i want to kind of wrap it up with one final question you know the purpose of the scores summit what you're all um, experiencing is to bring the community together by learning and being inspired by top leaders in the industry with the hope of amplifying ideas voiced by our community, putting them into action. As a leader, what are you hoping to achieve in the next five to 10 years? And what actions do you envision for and by the, by the community to make it better? Danielle, I'll start with you or either of you can start, whatever you'd like. I, I envision a, uh, a world where men's and women's soccer, soccer is invested in equally, not only in the United States, but globally. Mm -hmm. I picture a world where any kid who wants to play soccer can mm -hmm. uh, and play at any level that they feel is appropriate um, for themselves um, and that they want to achieve. And so I don't have all of the solutions for that. I, I think that there are, you know, we have to continue to walk through doors to figure out what the doors are beyond those doors that we need to walk through. Um, but I think this is a great game. It has given me so much. I am so grateful. I think it has the power to connect. It has the power to help um, individuals grow. And mm -hmm. I envision a world where every man, woman, boy, and child and girl can get to do that. Mm -hmm. Cindy, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I once again agree with Danielle, um, but five to 10 years, okay. Um, I think for US soccer, um, the goal is to be a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and part of this is in our programming and in the youth game. So like Daniel said, um, everybody that wants to play soccer not only has the opportunity, um, but has the opportunity to play, but also has the opportunity to succeed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, has the tools that they need to succeed. Um, and I would love for soccer participation in our country um, to be more representative of our population. Um, mm -hmm. I want soccer to be for everyone, um, regardless of the level um, and regardless of disability. Um, and on a personal level, five to 10 year goals, um, I just wanna continue working with my husband to raise our kid to be a kind, compassionate, <laughs> confident, happy kid. Um, who knows that he has the ability to positively impact other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, we'll both continue to strive to be a positive role model for him. Well, Cindy and Danielle, thank you so much for joining us this morning. This conversation was incredibly inspiring and I hope that all of our viewers got as much out of it as I got out of it. I feel very inspired and learned so much and it's amazing. There's something about soccer and, and all sports for that matter that so many people can relate to and the lessons and the um, triumphs you have from on the field translate so well to off the field. And I just wanna thank you ladies so much for your candor and for being so inspiring and open about your experiences and uh, helping all the people that are, that are watching now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Elizabeth. Love you, Cindy. You're the best. Love you. It was fun. <laughs> On behalf of America Scores, thank you, Cindy, Elizabeth, and Danielle. This was really an awesome discussion. Um, and we will have replays that will be available tomorrow um, on the site. And we have some great sessions coming up the rest of the week. Um, some big names, some of your teammates, Brandy Chastain and uh, Julie Faldi will be on tomorrow at nine. We have some great sessions the rest of the day today, decolonizing play. And we have female football. I saw Casey Gray is on here and that will be a great session also. Um, thank you so much and hope to see you soon and have a wonderful day and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.